Bye. So now it's um, 11 past 12. So we are almost perfect with the timings. Um, as you see in the schedule here, it's going to be me and Simo now talking about from data storage to your science. It's, um, you know, very generic talk, but it's, it's good in my opinion to set the basics. We've been doing it. We've been doing this type of basics things over over the years. And um, it's good to start with some definition of what people mean with computing. And uh, of, of course, it's always good to cite some XKCD cartoon. And this is very, very representative of the average picture of, of a researcher in academia, but also in industry, honestly, the, the picture is the same. So the one guy is asking, this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. And what if the answers are, are wrong? You just steer the, you know, steer the pile until they spit, and, until they start looking right. So in general, scientific computing is about getting some data in, doing some magic with the data and getting something out. But of course, in between, it's not just a, a black box. There's so many things to take into account. Which resources do you need? And I'm really talking about physical, you know, hardware, hardware resources, or maybe what you need to be careful with the code, with the environment, so that you, you can, for example, reproduce what you do. So here we have a common scientific computing flowchart, which is basically what the cartoon was saying earlier. You get some data, you get some models that might come from other sources. You have hypotheses from the literature or whatever you learn from the literature. And then everything gets gathered into this process, process block. And so given the data, the models and whatever, else you need to gather together, you generate uh, the outputs, which could be these derivatives, so-called derivatives file. They can be figures, they can be tables. And then you write your papers, your posters, and, and, and so on. So what actually happens in practice, and I know this is super basic, maybe most of you have done this in, uh, in high school, but it's always good to set the, the dictionary for, for everyone. So there's a there's this type of user layer, which is where, where we are right now. And as a user, you might work with some applications. You might use R, MATLAB, Python, and so on. The applications are on top of a so-called operating system. It can be Linux, it can be Windows, it can be Mac, whatever. And on top of the operating system, we have the actual hardware, the CPU, central processing units, where the actual math happens the memory, random access memory, which is where you want to store your variables or your code for the time that the CPUs can access it. This uh, SSD, which is basically the a little bit slower and, it, and bigger storage for storing the data or the code or whatever else you need to store. In some hardwares, we also have the GPUs, which are like CPUs but many of them compressed together so that things can be done much faster in parallel. And we will talk about this in the day two and three. But then of course, yes, you have connectivity because sometimes you need to download data from external sources to your laptop, or maybe you're not even on your laptop like we will show tomorrow and the day after because your laptop doesn't have GPUs, your laptop doesn't have enough RAM, so you are in some remote system connected via the internet where you can run your things. So here we wrote together a kind of a glossary of these terms in case some of these are not familiar. But now maybe if I can ask a question to Simo, like what, what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of started to describe what's a laptop and what's the normal workflow that people might be familiar with, but how do I know, how to know when I need to scale up to a bigger system? Yes, because, another... Yeah, maybe another question that, mm. that I can add is that often people, they move their workflow from the laptop to some HPC system and they realize that it's actually slower there. Why is mm. it so? Yes, so so if we think about the previous, uh, previous uh, diagram of the scientific process that, uh, that you showed, 
it didn't show anything about how do you plan on doing this like it or which hardware are you planning to use for any of these things like the where do you do the processing for the raw data and the models and what do you do with the derivatives uh, it doesn't show it doesn't have any connection or necessarily like def definition of where do where should you run this where should you do these calculations and for many of us it's of course we are using the ne nearest machine that we have let's say our computer like our laptop that is provided by the department so we are using the most obvious resource that we have to do many of these calculations and usually uh, that machine is for you that machine is is dedicated for you that is yours and when we are then sp speaking about high performance computing we are talking about the process where we're multiple where we're pooling resources so that we can share the resources like we have uh, usually funding from from a bigger bigger um, provider that, that gives us possibility of getting bigger machines. Uh, and the bigger machines are then shared by multiple people. So some of that process, let's say we have a experiment that we want to do, but one part of that process of doing the analysis is so, so slow with our laptop that we would want to do it fa faster. And for that, we need to use some shared resource. But the shared resource, because of the nature that it's shared, we need to usually like this ask uh, the correct things from it, or we need to like reserve our correct portion of it. So, if if we uh, don't reserve the correct portion of of this resource, we might reserve less resource than what our laptop has, or we might uh, reserve reserve resources that that don't ha ha solve the correct problem that we are currently like doing. So for example, like we might reserve like a GPU and, and think that our, well, GPUs usually make stuff faster, right? Like that's mm -hmm. the narrative. So let's just reserve a GPU and let's just hope that it runs faster. But that doesn't necessarily work like that if the program you're using doesn't use GPUs. It, it doesn't necessarily work. So when we are switching from our laptop from uh, to to the shared resources, we usually switch to a different location. So, so and a different location might have well different um, different things that um, make the computing faster. So so we need to like basically spe we we take advantage of the specialized hardware. So so for example, our laptops might have uh, maybe eight maybe sixteen CPUs. And the nodes, the, the computational servers in an HPC cluster, they might have up to 256 processors. But those processors might be slower than the laptop processors on average. But because there's so many of them, if your program can utilize many processors, your program can still be faster. So, so there's these kinds of like, okay, there's different... Um, different kinds of re or the resources in the HPC cluster are specialized for certain kinds of things. And, and when, when we are asking, okay, how do I want to run my code better or faster, we need to know what our program does and then ask for those resources that, uh, that the computational uh, cluster can provide that makes, makes it faster. Yeah, and and here are a few of the like re really great uh, questions that you can ask yourself. So, for example, do you need more CPUs? Like, if you can parallelize your processing, we'll talk about this on day three. Uh, you might benefit from adding CPUs. Sometimes you don't. You might want one big computer or multiple small computers. That might also benefit you. If your code uses GPUs, like for example, deep learning stuff nowadays, you might the, your only option might be to run it on a computing cluster because the model might be so big that you cannot run it on a normal laptop or computer. Your laptop might not even have a GPU. Mm -hmm. 
so and sometimes you have a lot of data that you need to process so you need to get the data uh, you need to make certain that the data is in the correct place so that the speed is speed is good so <clears throat> when it, when you're switching from your laptop to using these shared resources uh, do like keep in mind that uh, you're basically switching places you're switching to a completely different environment and in there in that environment there are different kinds of like considerations like like there's different kinds of op it's optimized for different kinds of use cases and if you uh, find find it well you don't know necessarily what what use case you want to do or what you don't know what your program is doing, it's usually a good idea to ask help from more experienced users or uh, the system administrators and and so forth, so that they can figure out okay which which program your program benefits most from. Yeah, one aspect that you see here at the bottom that sometimes maybe you don't even need, like your laptop would be totally fine with the resources that you have, but it's the data that you're working with that cannot be taken away, that cannot be taken out from your share folder in the university. And so then these remote resources, these large computational resources can also be useful that the computations and the data stay in the remote. But of course you can still use your laptop with fake data or just for development. But basically, yeah, this session is kind of just to set the basics for everyone here. There's some, how do I do scientific computing? It's um, most likely you already know where to start, whether you're a Python, R, or whatever programming languages. There are good practices for each language and tools available. And you can understand already that what works on your laptop doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily going to work on the remote, on the remote cluster. But what we will see in the rest of the day and also in the next days is basically strategies to move, for example, the same so-called Python environment from your laptop to a remote location, or to make sure that uh, you have the software that you need to run in the remote location. Here, there's a picture of what Simo was saying earlier that um, once you leave your laptop, if you think that this is the internet, you can basically request remote servers, remote so-called nodes. So they are other pieces of hardware. There are other machines that can allow you to do your computations, not on your laptop anymore, but on the, on the, on the remote location. This picture is generic enough in a sense that uh, this is not specific to Alto. There are some of these open services. There's a list here in the bottom, like MyBinder or Google Collab, where you can run this type of computations via a so-called notebook interface with a web browser. What we will explore more tomorrow is this type of HPC clusters that universities usually uh, give access to and also the national providers like CSC in Finland. And often what you will notice and what we will remind also today is that sometimes to work with this system, you need to, it, it's not as easy as, you know, opening a web browser and using the so-called notebook interface, you might need to be familiar with the command line interface and access, for example, the login node, and then later request, you know, one of the hundreds of CPUs or GPUs and so on. But don't worry about this. We will cover this during the connection session in later today. And we are perfectly on time with our schedule now because it's 12.25. And I could keep screen sharing and give a motivational talk with uh, Samantha Witke. Samantha, are you 